Hi, everybody. Welcome to INE Live. I'm your host, Katherine Brown. If it's Tuesday, you know what that means. It is Tech Tuesday, and we have a great episode today. We've recently added to our awesome team of red teamers here at INE. Today, we're getting to know the newest INE cyber instructors and picking their brains a little bit on the hottest topics in the industry, including hands-on training, attack and defense strategies, and some personal insights. And we're taking your questions as well, as always. First, as we do each time we stream here on INE Live, I want to let you know that we are streaming live across social media platforms right now, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and for the first time, Twitter. So be sure to like, subscribe, and share on the social media platforms you're using so you can stay in the loop when we do go live. We want you to get involved. Talk to us, talk to others. We love to see that. Chat is uh, going this morning. Chat's rocking. I'd love to see that. Our team is monitoring chat. If you have a comment, drop it in there. If you have a question, go ahead and put a Q at the beginning so we can find those questions easily. And we'll get to as many as we can today. On today's stream, we have Josh, uh, Red Team instructors Josh Mason and Alexi Ahmed. Josh comes to INE from Jacobs, where he was a cyber instructor. He spent more than a decade in the Air Force as a cyber warfare officer and course director. Alexi comes to us from Hackersploit Cybersecurity, where he was a founder and CEO. He has more than six years of experience in penetration testing and information security and specializes in securing enterprise networks, Linux servers, and cloud infrastructure for companies, large, uh, companies and large organizations. Josh and Alexi, welcome. Thanks for being here. Glad to be here. Awesome. Thank you very much. So I just want to get started with, um, I, you know, I gave kind of a brief background, but if you can both introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about yourselves, your career, um, kind of how you got to where you are. Josh, let's start with you. Sure, Catherine. Um, I started out my adult career as a, uh, a pilot in the United States Air Force flying C-130 aircraft. After about six years, um, our family made a little bit of a change and I shifted into cyber warfare went and ran the first special operations communication squadron down at Hurlburt Field, Florida, the home of Air Force Special Operations Command, and then shifted over to the special operations school where I was a course director and instructor. Um, I got out of the military at the end of 2019 and went to work at uh, the DOD Cyber Crime Center's Cyber Training Academy as a contractor with Jacobs and taught digital forensics and cyber threat emulation as my primary, as well as introduction to computer hardware and networking and some other courses for our military members. Um, and then started up here a few months ago to working on PTS. Oh. Awesome, we are, we are really glad to have you here, Josh. How's it going here at INE so far? It is amazing, I love it. Good to hear it. Good to hear it. Um, Alexi, I'm going to ask you the same question. If you could just kind of introduce yourself, tell us a, a little bit about how you got to, to where you are now and, um, and your journey so far in your career. Sure. Um, well, I'm a penetration test and red teamer by trade. I started off my career as a Linux system administrator. And uh, through that process, I was introduced to security because an additional role or responsibility that I had at that point was to, you know, to essentially be able to secure servers. So that was sort of my first foray into cybersecurity and I really enjoyed it. And uh, so I made a transition into becoming a junior penetration tester. So I got uh, all the relevant training, uh, et cetera, and joined the company as a junior penetration tester where I worked for a couple of years, uh, essentially learning the, you know, tools and tricks of the trade, uh, bettering myself, shadowing senior penetration testers and was eventually promoted to a senior penetration tester, where I also, uh, again, uh, worked for a few years and I was responsible um, for essentially uh, leading and heading uh, the main pen testing or security team for that company. Uh, in 2017, I uh, decided to form or start my own company that uh, was essentially a cybersecurity consultancy firm that uh, offers pen testing, uh, you know, red teaming, etc. And uh, the main objective uh, that we had at that point was uh, sort of to incorporate cybersecurity awareness training with our security assessments uh, with the ultimate goal of uh, improving you know, companies' uh, security posture. Uh, and so I've been doing that for the last uh, five or six years now. Uh, and uh, you know, that's, uh, that, that's sort of a brief background. And uh, later or um, during the, uh, the last quarter of this year, I, um, I joined uh, INE. And uh, yeah, th that's pretty much it. And how has uh, how your time at INE been here so far, Alexi? Um, it's uh, been fantastic. Excellent team, excellent people. Uh, really, really excited to be here. Awesome. We're, we're really glad to have both of you, uh, as I mentioned. And I know that um, I know you guys have been very busy o over uh, the past couple months 
and weeks since you got here. Um, I want to jump into uh, to a little bit of the meat here, and I want to start with you, Alexi, but the question is, is for both of you. Um, how would you define the word vulnerability, and why do we see so many vulnerabilities in brand new software releases? Alexi, we'll start with you. Um, well, a vulnerability is essentially a weakness, flaw, or misconfiguration in a company's digital infrastructure or you know, within the employees that can be exploited by adversaries in order to gain access to, uh, in order to gain unauthorized access to a company's infrastructure and consequently customer data. Now, uh, in my opinion, um, at least, uh, the reason I think we've uh, had a surge in the number of vulnerabilities in new software releases is uh, as a result of a few factors, one of them being uh, the, you know, the, the new development philosophies uh, and methodologies that are in play. One, an example of this would be agile development and the focus uh, where, where the focus is essentially on releasing new features. And uh, we haven't seen a, a, you know, incorporation of security within uh, this particular development uh, methodology or philosophy. And so I think a lack of uh, integration of security within the development process or the development life cycle is one of those reasons. I would also say that there's a real lack of skills uh, within developers in regards to secure coding and developing secure software from the ground up. And uh, again, depending on the on the company that you're, you're talking about or the product that you're talking about, there may be an over-reliance on uh, bug bounties in that uh, companies and uh, you know organizations essentially uh, see security as an afterthought as opposed to something that they should actually implement uh, you know before and during the development process uh, Josh what, what's your take on this kind of a, a, an overall definition of vulnerability and um, you know why do we see so many of these in in brand new software yeah so vulnerability is just a weakness it's something that can be taken advantage of and Alexi hit on so many other great points, but it's they're easily overlooked if you're not looking for them. So you develop a program and you can follow the thing that you've always done, that you were taught to do, and you create an amazing app, you create a web app, you create software that people download. Whatever it is, you send it out and it works and it's awesome until someone does something that you weren't expecting, a use case that you didn't have in mind. They find um, some way to input data where you didn't inter want them to input data, and now it does something that it's not supposed to do. That's what a lot of vulnerabilities look like, and that's uh, what we try to find out as red teamers. We try to find those vulnerabilities so that then we say, hey, this is what you guys missed. Um, go back and add in some input validation. Go back and shorten you know, the input options for this so that you don't run into this out of the other exploit down the line and it's just like lexi said so many people want to get a product out and they might not have the development maturity in their organization to go through extensive testing maybe they're a startup and they need to get a product out otherwise they won't get their next um their next level of funding so they need something viable out there then they'll get the funding, then theoretically they'll do their securities. But yeah, there's no like set standard on how these things are supposed to happen or regulations and this has to happen. So we find vulnerabilities. So just a follow up there, um, Josh, as you're talking about vulnerabilities, can you go into detail a little bit on the difference between technical vulnerabilities and say human vulnerabilities? Oh, sure. So um, there's technical vulnerabilities, like I was saying, input validation is uh, a classic one, or local file injection is classic vulnerability that can like launch remote code execution. Your um, individual, your, sorry, uh, human ver vulnerabilities are more trying to get someone to click on something. Phishing campaigns, submission campaigns, um, any sort of social engineering revolves around trying to get someone to do something for you. And that's a whole different level of vulnerability. It's also something that we deal with as red teamers. Awesome. Uh, we have great questions coming in from the audience. So I just want to take a second to, uh, to get to one. This is from Chris Frazier, who is watching on YouTube and talking about the vulnerabilities. Chris asks, what would you say some of the vulnerabilities were unleashed to the public are actually uh, risks that were accepted by the business? 
Alexi, Alexi do you wanna... uh, yeah so i think um on, on that front uh companies or you know m mature companies or companies that have been, have been around for quite a while uh, will typically have a vulnerability management program and if they if they are or they do have uh, vulnerabilities that are being disclosed to them um then i, I typically would assume that they've essentially uh, gone through prioritization and have assessed the uh, the risk uh, in, in regards to whether or not they should actually uh, remediate that particular vulnerability. So I think, uh, you know, that all comes down to a, a company's own vulnerability management program and what uh, and what assets they, they think are the most important and whether or not they can take the risk of uh, of leaving a vulnerability and unpatched. So I think it all it all comes down to uh, a company's individual or um, essentially holistic view of their assets and uh, and what they consider to be uh, worth the risk or what's really not worth the risk. Yeah, great, uh, great point, like, Alexi. Josh, you want to weigh in? Yeah. Um, so some many developers are security minded. Often the organizations have limits on how much time can be spent developing things out. So code might go out. It might be great for production. Look good. Work good. Um, and then you have a punch list of items that need to be either mitigated or accepted. And just like Chris said, sometimes the organization will accept that risk, understanding that it might not have the same ROI spending the time to fix it as you would get um, if it was exploited. Maybe it's exploited and maybe the website looks funky for a little bit, but it doesn't actually affect any other user other than the person who was able to manipulate the website. There can be other risks, but in, in the end, the business has to decide, are we going to spend the money to develop this further, or are we going to accept that it might have repercussions down the line? And often that's not in the hands of the developers. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and, and it is something that businesses, I think, increasingly need to be uh, not only thinking about, but prioritizing. Um, the the security and um, you know the, the the safety of their data and making sure that it is protected. Um, we're gonna do something a little fun today. We're gonna bounce back and forth. It's kind of like gonna keep you like in a tennis match. We're gonna go like uh, personal questions about your journey and then more of the technical questions. So just keep uh, keep our audience and keep you guys on your toes. Um, I want to bounce back to the personal just for a second. And uh, Alexi, uh, we can start with you here. What would you say motivates you to work hard? We're talking about every day, some, some, some personal um, thing that drives you to show up and excel every day. Well, I'm extremely passionate uh, about what I do and uh, I'm, primar I'm primarily motivated by the fact that I believe that what I do and what we're doing here is making the digital world safer and is empowering security professionals by making them more security conscious and of course, providing them with the skills. So my, my primary motivation uh, comes from the fact that we're making the world better and safer. Josh, uh, what about you? What, what, what gets you showing up every day in that awesome headset? <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> I love this headset. Uh, it is, it's the same thing. We're helping people. It's, uh, it's why I joined the Air Force when I did. Um, I wanted to help people. I did that. Uh, here, we have the biggest battle space, really, across the, the world, fighting cybercrime and trying to keep companies and individuals safe and secure. And it's kind of up to so many of us. Getting into this industry is hard. And if we can create content that makes it easier for people to get started if they can get to what matters most and start understanding the bigger picture quicker, as well as gaining the skills and the hand on, hands-on experience to go and operate as soon as possible. That helps us all. And I love being part of that. Yeah, uh, just talking with you and, and you as well, Alexi, you can see that um, the passion that you both bring uh, when it comes to helping people. And, uh, and helping people fix some of the problems they have. I want to bounce back to the, uh, the technical question for a minute. How often and when should red team operations be performed? Josh, we can start with you here. Yeah, I'll take this one. Um, a lot of it de is determined based on uh, when, the last when the last pen test or red team operation began, but also based on the company's cyber maturity. So if you are a um, 
doing business as single proprietor organization, depending on your infrastructure, maybe you don't need a pen test. Like if it's your computer or two computers and like Google Drive, a pen test might not be like effective. If you found someone who would accept doing a red team operation on you, um, you might not be getting your money's worth. There are other ways of assessing your risk in those situations. However, if you are a medium-sized business growing, if you're a Fortune 1000, Fortune 500 company, then you might need them way more often, depending on what your kind of what your uh, attack surface looks like. How many endpoints do you have out there? Um, how many websites or software or services are out there being looked at? If you have a larger attack service, you want to maintain eyes on that attack service more often. Sorry, my cyber warfare officer days uh, coming out in that. <laughs> no, that's great. I think it's an excellent point um, that that it's really it's all proportional to uh, you know to, to how big your company is, like you mentioned, um, and how how big of a vulnerability that is. Alexia, I, I want to ask you the same question. How often um, do you think that they should be performed? And do you feel like businesses are um, currently utilizing these red team operations to the degree that they should be? Or do you feel like maybe they're being underutilized? Um, yeah, so coming back to what uh, Josh said a few seconds ago, I think it really depends on the size of, uh, of the company and the scope of the company's assets. So, you know, how many employees do they have? Um, how many you know assets do they have in terms of websites, servers, etc.? So uh, given that that is the case, and if we're talking about medium to large size companies, I would recommend uh, performing a red team assessment maybe once or twice a year. And of course, that's going to vary based on your attack surface uh, and the type of threats you're facing, uh, the complexity of the threats, um, et cetera, right? Um, now, I also want to point out that uh, you know red team assessments really aren't a good fit uh, for companies that don't have a mature security posture in that, um, you know, it's not good for companies that don't already have defenses set up. And uh, it makes sense uh, to actually perform a red team assessment if you're sure that uh, you have defenses set up and you're sure that, uh, uh, you know, the information or the uh, the reports that you'll get back from the red team assessment can be utilized in a productive way uh, to essentially uh, improve your security posture. Now, when it comes down to uh, whether or not they're underutilized, I think, um, you know, I think I really do think that that is the case primarily because and of course I'm making a generalization here, but I think a lot of companies really don't know how to utilize the results obtained by a red team or a red team operation and aren't really adept at implementing the patches or remediating the uh, vulnerabilities, uh, you know, whether human or digital that uh, were reported within uh, the red team uh, operation report. So I think uh, yes, they are being underutilized, and I think it comes down to the fact that companies really uh, aren't uh, able or aren't competent enough uh, to, to essentially uh, utilize the results and the reporting to make sure that they can, again, start uh, remediating any issues and, of course, uh, setting up or improving their proactive approach to security. Yeah, great question coming in um, right now from Shauna Hargrave, who is watching on LinkedIn. Shauna, thank you so much for the question. Um, she asks, how should smaller businesses make sure they're secure if they aren't at that pen test level? Alexi? Um, well, I think um, it, it really, again, comes down to the number of assets uh, that they have and, uh, you know, so the number of computers, the number of employees. And I would typically recommend for a small company uh, to essentially have, uh, you know, regular pen tests, but not, uh, you know, uh, not pen tests, uh, you know, ev every quarter or anything like that. But what I would recommend is uh, essentially getting a vulnerability management program uh, that uh, that will be able to track and uh, identify vulnerabilities on the employees' uh, computers, for example. And then, of course, uh, they, they can outsource the process of remediating these vulnerabilities if they don't ha already have a security team uh, to an external company. But uh, if they're not really at the level of a pen test, then again, being able to track, identify, uh, remediate, uh, and verify, uh, you know, vulnerabilities and their remediations is is very important. So a vulnerability management program should be suitable for that level. Josh, I saw you nodding your head there when he started talking about a vulnerability management uh, program. Do you think that's the way to go for these smaller companies that really aren't at the pen testing level yet? Oh yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Uh, for no matter what your organization is, you're going to need to start with a rest, risk assessment. So there's several different frameworks um, to work from, but once you identify what your attack service looks like, 
and what what vulnerabilities do you know about and set about remediating those just from like the known things because those are easy to audit and those are easy to check you take what software you're using and you check to see if there's vulnerabilities before them um, that's pretty common and organizations should know how to do that already then you can add in vulnerability scanning software um, nessus is an easy one that many people know about or open vast solar winds has several uh, different products there's tons of products that you can use for vulnerability scan but that's where you should start once you've accepted or remediated or um, mitigated uh, what you find from your risk assessment your vulnerability scans then you want to take a deeper dive and that's what a red team operation does that's what a pen test does is now they're not just do these things exist it's what other weaknesses weren't are out there that weren't found by the known scanners can we get in through means that you didn't know about before hmm. i that's i think it's great advice uh, from both of you and just some some great insight um, from your expertise i want to get back to one of the one of the more personal questions and this is a great question for both of you you both look very fit you both look uh like you take care of yourselves very healthy so um when we're talking about, particularly, a lot of people are working from home these days, right? And a large part of the workforce in cybersecurity seems to involve sitting at a desk for long periods of time and, and maybe even longer now that people aren't um, in offices all the time. You, know, you just kind of go in that room in your house or whatever and you, you shut the door and you like look up and it's 4.30 in the afternoon, right? Um, so whether you're working from home, whether you're in an office, when you're in this particular profession, what can you do to keep uh, yourself fit and functional really we're talking about weight control um working out like what what are some strategies that you guys have implemented to really avoid that stagnant you know desk zone uh lifestyle josh so um mine's easy i've got a, a chocolate lab and a six-year-old and four-year-old so <laughs> whether no i want to get up and move or not on my own motivation it's happening because um if it's been a while, someone will come and visit me or a dog will bark and say, hey, um, we need to go out and do like run around. Um, but one of the great things about being at your home is if you want to get up and just like do some jumping jacks or some push ups, there's no one like at a cubicle behind you to be like, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> and, you know, the ground is clean because uh, it's your house. You cleaned it, hopefully. Um, it's a, I don't know. I think it's a great thing. Um, if you need to take a break in the middle of the day, unless you've got meetings or whatnot, go, take a break, go outside, walk the dog, play with the kids. If you can adjust your schedule, work with what you're allowed to do if you work from home. If you can adjust your hours a little bit so you get whatever work done, and then you can go to the park, take like one day a week and get out early, go do personal stuff, maybe work that evening. I don't know. It's been in on a lot of your company but for me it's focusing on trying not to just sit here all day i will i will hear about it if i do that um <laughs> and often I'll, I'll have people sitting on my lap looking at like youtube kids while i'm typing away actually sometimes that happens in the middle of uh, some i e meetings <laughs> <laughs> i i've seen that happen your kids are adorable uh josh <laughs> yeah but uh yeah, no, it's, um, you know, we're in this really interesting space where um, we're all, I guess by now, a, a year and a half later, kind of working our way into figuring out how to make this new routine, these new um, habits stick and, and work for us. Um, Alexi, I'm, I'm, um, I am curious what your habits have been. What, how, do you, how do you keep from getting into that like tunnel vision zone of just like m typing and sitting there? Like, what do you do to make sure you're staying fit, functional, and really sharp mentally? Um, well, I think one, one of the key things here is to imp implement a healthy lifestyle into your workday. And, and what that essentially entails is, as uh, Josh mentioned, uh, the process of, you know, taking regular walks, uh, maybe, you know, uh, joining the gym or something like that, uh, and essentially incorporating, uh, you know, a healthy, active lifestyle into your day so that you have a healthy balance between, you know, sitting at the desk and, of course, uh, activity, really. Um, you know, I would also recommend, uh, you know, taking uh, breaks away from your desk every one or two hours and, of course, stretching out your muscles, 
uh, primarily your back muscles, which are going to be the most affected. And uh, on, on that particular point, uh, you know, I think given your current situation and whether, you know, this is going to be your life for uh, the next couple of years, I would recommend getting a standing desk uh, as uh, controversial as that is, uh, or, a, uh, or, you know, getting a very good ergonomic chair uh, that is, uh, again, designed or, you know, made to actually support your back and provide, uh, provide you with good posture. So I think um, incorporating a healthy lifestyle that in, in involves exercise and, of course, uh, taking a closer look at your desk ergonomics and the fact that you're, when you're at your desk, you're as comfortable as, uh, as possible. Uh, your back is relaxed and, and not, uh, not contorted in any way. And, uh, of course, ensuring uh, that you're, you're really not going through any pain or uh, strains uh, when you're at the desk. Yeah, great tips. I, I think anyone who is uh, remotely connected with this field knows that it that it can be very stressful at times. So you can just kind of find yourself very tensed up and, um, you know, and just, just totally focused in um, on your work. So getting those tips and knowing, you know, the importance of that. Would, just a quick kind of lightning question for both of you. Would, would you say it's um, essential to, to develop these habits of moving around? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, essential, yeah. Um, all right, so tips for all of you out there. As soon as this uh, stream wraps up, you can get out there for a, for a jog. No excuses today. You've heard it from the instructors. Um, our, and speaking of instructors, our director of cybersecurity, Jack Reedy, recently provided some insight toward the multiple team colors within the field last week. And for our home audience, if you'd like to see that video, it is available on our YouTube channel. Um, you can go ahead and watch that. But my question for, for the two of you today is, what are your thoughts on red team versus blue team operations? And do you consider purple teaming efforts to be worth the time? Josh, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I taught both red and blue when I was at uh, DeSita, and um, really what the military does is a version of purple teaming. You have what we were teaching was two different roles, but when the team goes out, it's the full cyber protection team with both of those roles. So you have someone working to emulate the threat, and then you've got someone working alongside the local defenders, teaching them and showing them how to identify and investigate and uh, remediate and mitigate the risk. So um, I'm a huge believer in purple, purple teaming. And when you've got giant organizations like the US military or Fortune 500s, I think it's crucial. That's how you're going to get your defenders, your SOCs, your um, MSSPs uh, upgrading like or leveling up to be better than what they were before because you need to actively throw some things at them that maybe they're not seeing on their own. Maybe on a day-to-day -day basis, they're used to working with these things. And if they don't see Revil ransomware, then they just read about it. So why not do a purple team where, hey, this is gonna fly at you and it should look like this. And then you actually execute it. And um, then they go, whoa, we were not prepared for that. How do we get better so that if we do have to actually see it, how can we respond even faster? I'm, I'm a big fan of purple team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alexi, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Red team, blue team, purple team, the interaction between the three, um, and, and you know, what, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I think as uh, Josh made a few important, um, really useful points, I think in my opinion, uh, I think the, the, whole, um, the whole problem that the purple team you know, is set out to, to solve or to fix is really the lack of communication between the red and blue teams. Uh, in that, uh, you know, the, the purple team is essentially responsible for uh, maximizing the effectiveness of both of both of these teams, red and blue. And uh, in, in doing so, an example that, that Josh gave was, uh, you know, ha is essentially where you, the purple team would have the red team create challenges for the blue team to solve. And in doing so, both teams are able to improve uh, their organizational security level and enhance the skills uh, of the individuals within both of these teams. So. I think um, it's really it's really set out to to solve the problem uh, that we've seen many times, where you know the results from the from a red team are submitted to the blue team, and uh, you know there really isn't any interact interaction or communication around uh, what these threats look like when they're when when they're live, uh, what they may look like if utilized in a, by a different adversary, etc. So I think um, purple teaming is really great and. Uh, it's actually, um, you know, it, it really is important at improving the synergy between both red and blue teams. And you've got a nice purple background, 
there, Alexi, to, uh, <laughs> to reinforce Not the message. Related. The purple counts. Purple is important, right? Um, I want to jump back into uh, a little bit of personal questions, and this is just a fun one. Um, if you had a warning label, what would it say, Alexi? What, what would your warning label say? Uh, I didn't even think I needed one, but probably do not disturb. <laughs> I like that one. I like that one. Josh, what about you? Uh, contents may be hot. Like on a <laughs> coffee mug. <laughs> nice, nice. I just thought, you know, that's a, that's a great question. Everybody could use a, probably everyone could have, could have their own warning label. So I think it gives a little insight into your personality and the way you, um, you know, the way you operate just to hear yours. So do not disturb and contents may be hot. All right. Fair enough. Um, I want to get your thoughts moving into the education space about the current state of education. Um, and this is something that, gosh, <laughs> can be debated for, for eons, right? Um, but Josh, we'll start with you. Do you feel like you need a degree to enter this field? And do you think degrees are relevant in cybersecurity or technology? anymore at all. There are ways, as we know here at INE, to get, um, you know, to get the expert training without a degree, but we've heard people talk about, you know, there are a lot of advantages to having degrees. So where do you fall on that, uh, on that side of the debate? So I, I love this question because um, I don't think you need a degree to do anything in cyber. Um, I've got a bachelor's of science in humanities with a minor in philosophy and a minor in Russian history and or Russian language. And then I've got an MBA, nothing technical there other than core requirements to get that bachelor's of science, um, which was one course in computer science. Everything I've been able to do since was taught by the military and is basically what we include in PTS really. Um, plus a little bit more, but anyone can do this work it's not that epic it's just people don't know about it there is value to a degree there is value to learning how to take in information and process it and give feedback and critical thinking about that information do you need a degree to do that no can you get that at college yeah my dad was a network engineer and he had a degree in uh, intercultural religious studies did it help him with being a network engineer? No, but I think it did give him some critical thinking and uh, critical thinking skills. And now he's a director at a um, startup company doing amazing work. And we've got examples here of people who are doing great things without a degree, without a cyber degree. Do I know some people like uh, John Helmus and Jerry Osher who have studied extensively in computer science and cybersecurity and have PhDs and utilize those in ways to help others and their organizations? Yes. Is it required? No. But um, it's kind of up to, I think, the individual to determine how much you want to put in. Can you get a job and have a great career without the degrees? Yes, you can. Do you want to get a degree? If you want to get a degree, I say go for it. That's what I did. I think that's a great point that you make that, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a degree in cyber to have a great career in cyber, right? But a degree can come in helpful, like that story about your dad, I think, um, you know, hits right to the heart um, of that argument that, you know, you, you can learn other skills through, um, through college or through whatever experiences, you know, these, these kind of skills that are on the side of what you're learning that can ultimately help you in your goal. Alexi, what are your thoughts on this? Um, well, I'll, I'll preface my response by saying this. Uh, I do not think that you need a degree to get into cybersecurity or pen testing for that matter. However, they are extremely useful. And an example of this would be a computer science degree. Uh, the reason I think uh, that they are useful for anyone getting into cybersecurity is primarily because cybersecurity and pen testing is an intersection of multiple facets of technology where you have operating systems, networking, programming, et cetera. And that's why I would recommend a computer science degree because it sort of gives you that foundation uh, that again, will make things easy as you progress. But of course, all of these can be learned individually and you don't need to go to college for that. Uh, however, if someone uh, you know, was at that stage in their life where, and you know, sort of deciding as to whether uh, you know, a degree is important, I would say that it is. 
and they also have the option of pursuing certifications while pursuing their degree. So I think having a degree uh, specifically in computer science, at least in my experience, has proved to be very helpful. And with any of the other individuals and professionals that I've dealt with, it sort of gives them, uh, you know, very smooth uh, or, you know, a, a very, uh, you know, very good uh, launching pad for their cybersecurity career because they really don't have to catch up on the fundamentals because they have experience with all of these intersecting topics, whether it be networking, programming, operating systems, et cetera. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the certification specifically, um, Alexi. I want to dig in a little bit deeper on that. Um, and get both of your thoughts on the technology certifications that are out there right now. Are they helpful or harmful to the HR and hiring practices? Um, and should they expire ever? Should, should you have to continue taking these over and over again? Alexi, we'll start with you here. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think, firstly, um, it really depends on the type of, cert of certification. If it's a pen testing certification, then you know I would um, you know I would uh, have it out there that uh, I probably have to renew it every five years or something like that just to make sure that you're keeping up with your skills. Although that could easily be replaced by work experience. Um, now coming back to the main question, uh, do I see them as being harmful um, uh, during the hiring process? I think that, that uh, you know a, a lot of credence has been put on certifications and. Uh, Many companies actually make their determinations on whether they should hire someone based on certifications. However, um, I, I really see that the main issue uh, within, uh, you know, the HR departments within companies is, is that they sort of adopt a system where they give credence to a certification and never seek to update that or actually check out the market and the various requirements for the job and whether this certification still holds up in regards to its technical prowess and whether or not it's able to give professionals or students the skills they require to fill that role. So I think um, companies are putting you know, too much focus on certifications and using that as a benchmark uh, without you know, keeping up to date with the latest within the industry. And I really think that they should be, you know, keeping an eye on other certifications and reviewing certifications regularly, uh, so that they get a very accurate picture of um, of certifications in general and what they bring on the table. Um, Josh, what do you think? Uh, certifications good for recruiting purposes, good for HR, bad for everyone. What do you think? So. I think they started out really good. Um, I think that there was training out there and you validated your training by, by getting the certification. And I believe in that model. It's like having a diploma for your training. You had to learn a certain set of information, accomplish it, and show that you could uh, regurgitate or reuse the skills up to a certain level. And I think that's great, um, just as from an education and training point of view. Now for HR and hiring, I think that we use it that it gets used as a crutch and like alexi said it's often out of date and really in the end we a lot of companies i've seen will put up a ton of certifications and requirements but what they end up hiring off of is not even their job posting they hire off of a connection who they know has certain skills that they want and um the statistics are in line with that. Uh, close to 90% of all jobs are filled by someone who um, didn't apply in a traditional like job uh, page manner. Usually it's someone who uh, the person knows or is um, brought to them. So is it useful to highlight yourself and have your resume have tons and tons of certifications on it? Um, I hope that by gaining certifications, people understand get training and learn skills and knowledge and can use those things um should we be having it as a requirement or a qualification um as has been done in some giant organizations i don't think so i i think it's e sometimes easy to pass a test depending on the test depending on the individual and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be good at your job it just means that you have learned some information and then you passed a test i like I said, huge fan of that because it shows that you were able to use what you learned, but should we have it as the, the end all be all for whether someone is qualified for a job? No, I think you, you miss candidates who maybe didn't have the money to go to that training and get that certification. I think you might end up with paper tigers, people who 
studied really hard and learned some stuff and then who knows if it's still good they might have done a, an older version of the test um, how current they are on it whether it should expire or not i i don't know that it really matters because if you look at when the person took the test and actually look at their skills and their knowledge then it kind of doesn't matter when or what version of the certification they got if in the interview when you talk to them and really get at the heart of what skills and knowledge do they need to do the job that's what really matters so should they expire or not i i don't see any reason why they need to be maintained hmm. so we've talked about education uh training certifications great follow-up question coming in uh from warren ben david who is asking for some tips for someone who wants to start a career. And I'll say this, uh, I'm gonna ask you guys a two-pronged question here because we have quite uh, the age debate going on in chat and a lot of people wanting to uh, wanting to know what age is is too old. So we've got someone who's 41 in here saying, is this too, uh, is this too late to start a career in cyber? Um, other people saying they're you know 50, 40, whatever. Um, so I would say, ask both of you and Alexi we'll, we'll start with you can you just give some tips for someone who wants to start a career and um, you know is there a, is there an age when you would say eh, th this is gonna be too much um, well um, for anyone who is looking to get into a cybersecurity career I would uh, you know recommend that they get started with the fundamentals or the foundational knowledge required so Again, uh, I would recommend learning networking, operating systems, a bit of programming, etc., uh, so that it gives them a rounded off, uh, you know, starting point or a very well, um, a, a, ver a very good starting point uh, as they then move into, you know, cybersecurity. Uh, the second thing I'll say on that is cybersecurity is quite a wide field in regards to the types of jobs or the types of uh, of roles that one can fill. So I think. Uh, also having an understanding early on of what you like and what you find is uh, is interesting is quite important. So, for example, are you interested in digital forensics? Are you interested in pen testing? Are you interested in reverse engineering? All, all, all of that has to come into play. And that will, of course, shape, um, essentially give you an idea of the direction that you need to go down. Uh, once you've got, you know, your foundational information or knowledge sorted out, I would then recommend based on your career choice, or the path that you want to, to, to go down, I'd recommend you know starting uh, you know uh, essentially getting started with certificates and certifications, training, etc., and and sort of getting um, uh, you know a real good understanding of what the, the the job requirements are, what your responsibilities are, and and sort of uh, you know essentially getting your feet wet with the, the the particular role that you're trying to. To, to actually get into so if you're getting into pen testing then i would recommend you know starting uh starting out with um you know with, with various virtual labs and virtual lab in, uh, environments that will allow you to test your skills improve your skills etc so you know uh, that's uh, pretty much my answer for that as per the age question i really don't think that age is uh, is really a topic here i think it's just it just becomes relevant or important when when you start comparing yourself uh, yourself to anyone or everyone else. Really, uh, I think you know I really don't think that age should any should be any hindrance if you're dedicated and passionate about uh, what, what you're doing and if you want to get into cybersecurity, then you know definitely go for it. Don't worry about what everyone else is doing. Just uh, go into it with a beginner's mind and uh, you know make sure that you progress in a steady fashion. Yeah, awesome advice, Alexi, and BSEC on YouTube pointing out, uh, as you can see on the screen there, Elon Musk is 50. He didn't start working in the space realm until his late 30s and 40s. Age is just a number. If you have passion, age will not stop you. Josh, agree, disagree? I know you agree. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, it doesn't matter how old you are. Uh, for this career field, really all you need to be able to do is understand things and then make them useful and valuable to the organization. So what I say to anyone who's, let's say later in life, uh, not a like high school or college graduate trying to get into cybersecurity is lean on your experience. What have you done? You've been alive for a long time doing stuff. So like, how can you leverage that to your advantage? Do you want to go in as a 
like entry level SOC one analyst or pen tester and make what you know people in their early 20s are making uh, fresh out of school or do you want to i don't know are you any good at sales are you any good at marketing are you any good at um business needs and management and project management because you can learn what you already knew but relevant to cybersecurity, and then leverage that for a position because we need those we need project managers and uh risk management professionals auditors and people coming up with strategy at a higher level we don't always need millions and millions of pen testers or stock one analysts so those are those are perfectly fine jobs all of them there's 54 roles identified by uh nist and nice um and i'd say go take a look and find one that really speaks to you and drive towards that the great thing about all this no matter what age you are no matter what your background is if you start moving towards one role in cybersecurity, you move closer to all of them so if you start learning something and you find this isn't like hitting it for me i i enjoy the overall thing but like i don't like doing pen tests all day um i do these capture the flags and like they're fun and stuff but like i don't want to do this as my job that's perfectly fine what did you learn you learned all about networking and vulnerabilities risk assessment and uh what the um what cyber criminals are doing can you turn that into something else can you av advise an organization and how they can better um lower their attack surface or mitigate their risk because you might not be actively pen testing them but you could still help them find solutions to their problems in the realm so i think it's great advice um, from both of you and great insight from uh, from two people who are very successful and um, are, are continuing on that track we have a few more minutes here and i want to ask you um, each just one more question as we get ready to wrap up here today and just get to know you um, a little bit better. Um, Josh, we'll start with you. What is your favorite thing about your career? And if you could just kind of expound on it and give, you know, give a story, explain what, what you love about your career from a, from a personal and a professional standpoint. Like my career so far or my career currently? I guess uh, I'll just uh, yes. my career currently. Sure. <laughs> Um, I love being able to help people. Um, I've said it earlier and it's uh, cliche perhaps, but finding something that I'm at all good at and helps other people has just, I think it's a, a, a blessing really um, to be able to every day do something that I enjoy that I know people are getting something out of. Um, when I was flying, I did air medical evac and delivered supplies to people who were in in need of those supplies. Um, when I was at the special operations school, we were training people to go out and operate in environments, training them in what they really needed to know to be effective and safe. And um, did the same thing at Jacobs, preparing military individuals to go and do um, essentially blue and red and purple teaming so that they can harden our systems and better protect uh, the US government and the military. And he, now at INE, being able to help students all across the globe at different levels of their development, their training, and their cyber career, it's it gets me hyped. I love it. Awesome. Uh, Alexi, what about you? What, what do you love about your career from both a personal and a professional standpoint? Well, I think what, um, what what drew me personally to this field or this industry was really the the constantly changing and evolving landscape in terms of threats, tools, tactics, and techniques. So th that really excites me. I love when, when when there's constant change and whenever you know that there's a new type of threat, new type of malware. Um, so I really like that aspect of cybersecurity. I'm a person who really likes, uh, you know, a dynamic type of, uh, of life in that, um, you know, I, re I really don't like getting, you know, getting into a rut or having my, my environment and what I'm doing too static. So uh, that's pretty much what I really, really love about my career is that it's constantly changing. And then furthermore, professionally, uh, what I also really, really enjoy is the fact that I'm doing exactly what I want to do, which is, of course, uh, provide training to professional students, etc., and helping them 
uh, you know, improve their careers, helping them get the jobs that they want. Um, so I think, you know, th th those two factors are really just, uh, you know, what, what makes me really passionate and excited every day about, you know, what I'm doing. And uh, it's uh, something that I really love. The industry is lucky to have both of you uh, bringing your passion, your knowledge, your energy, um, and, and your intensity to just to the, to the overall community. We at INE are certainly lucky that, uh, that you guys are both on our team here. Thank you for being on today's stream. Really appreciate your time and, um, and your expertise. Thanks. Thank you very much. Awesome. All right, that wraps up today's stream. If you missed it live, look for the replay across our social media channels as well as on the INE website. You can look for us again live one week from today, Tuesday, November 2nd, for another episode of Tech Tuesday. And throughout the month of October, if you've been following us, you know this, we're hosting cybersecurity specific streams in honor of Cybersecurity Awareness Month. This Thursday, October 28th, two days from today, INE's Chief Content Officer Neil Bridges will be here for an Ask Me Anything, along with Head of Cybersecurity Content, Jack Reedy. So get those questions ready, fire it at those two gentlemen. We also have an awesome promotion going on right now here at INE. We are nearing Halloween, which means, of course, our annual BUGO sale is on. Take a look. Two years for $9.99, an incredible deal. Be sure to take advantage of that. And be sure to like and subscribe on the social media platform you are using right now so you can stay in the loop when we do get live. We'll see you again next time. Until then, have a great week.